so I think we'll get start get started. Um, welcome to our online salon series presentation for November. I'm excited that tonight has finally come. We have a great group of panelists to who are going to share information with you, but we also have a fantastic researcher here who's gonna share her work with you and we'll get to that in a moment. My name is Ellen Whiteman and I am the manager of the McDowell Foundation. The foundation funds teacher-led research in the province of Saskatchewan and gives us the ability to support teachers such as the ones you're gonna hear from tonight in sharing their passion, in sharing their knowledge and in sharing their work. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I am currently on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis. Whenever I do these salon series, the land acknowledgement is very important to me. Education got us into this and education gets us out of it. That was what Mary Sinclair said. I often think research could be substituted for that, you know? Some, some of what got us into this was certainly responsible for what would be considered research. And I think research is one of the keys to getting us out of this. So I, I think about the land upon which I work and I play and I live. I think about the relationships I have to the land and the people of the land. I'm very grateful that I get to be a part of the research that is moving us forward and moving us into places of reconciliation. I know we have people joining us from other territories, some of which are seated and some of which may not be. So I'd encourage you to consider your own relationships to the land and to the people of which you share it with and your own thoughts around reconciliation. Tonight, I'm also very pleased to welcome the Chinook Teachers Association. We appreciate Chinook's willingness to come on board, do a bit of intro for us, and also the friendship and partnership they've shown the foundation over the last number of years. So thank you, Trevor, thank you, Neil. We appreciate your willingness to come and be part of this tonight. So Trevor, now I'd invite you to just bring brief greetings from the association, but also I had asked you to say just a few words about Raquel. I know we're, we're all very happy to celebrate her work with us tonight. Good evening. Uh, my name is Trevor Frozy, and it is my pleasure as a member of the Chinook Teachers Association Executive to introduce Raquel Beam, who will be presenting her research on how creating community and social connections can help support deep understanding in an asynchronous distance learning environment. Raquel Beam has been a teacher for 22 years in Swift Current and has spent the last 11 years teaching online. Like many teachers in rural education, her subject areas have been diverse, ranging from law to cosmetology, through her initial, though her initial education training was in math and biology. Raquel has her Master of Education in Educational Technology and Design and is finishing her PhD which examines challenges and processes to create community and social connection in asynchronous distance learning. She's continued to facilitate professional development opportunities, supporting blended and distance learning through the STF professional learning community and in her local association. She also supports future distance learning educators as a sessional lecturer at the U of S, focusing on designing e-learning environments for education. She enjoys being involved in any creative endeavor, including drawing, felting, sculpting, and baking. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the McDowell Foundation for their support of Raquel's research. Uh, the Chinook School Division has benefited greatly from Raquel's many contributions to our students and teachers, and I'm thrilled that she has the opportunity to share her expertise with teachers around the province tonight. So please join me in welcoming Raquel Beam. Thank you so much, Trevor. We really appreciate that, the, that your local association is here to support her in her work. And I know in talking to her how much support sorry, she's received from the division and from the local as she's gone about this. So, so thank you for that. A couple more things to say, and then I'll turn it over to you, Raquel, if that's all right. So joining us tonight are teachers from across the province, local association leaders, McDowell Foundation board members, SDF staff, ministry staff, superintendents, directors of education, principals, vice principals. We're thrilled that all of you feel that this is an important evening to come together and learn. I know it's almost the end of a very, very busy time for teachers and I'm always greatly honored that you give up your Thursday evening and you spend it with us to, to, to come together as colleagues and to learn from each other. Um, it's a real gift that you give us. 
So as Trevor mentioned, our panel tonight includes Raquel, as well as others that are going to introduce themselves as soon as Raquel's done her presentation. So just a couple of small housekeeping things. Raquel is gonna present for about 20 minutes, although we're not gonna be real firm on her. I know, I know that she has amazing things to say. Then we're gonna open it up to the rest of the panel to introduce themselves and then hopefully have a pretty casual conversation about some of the things that Raquel's found in her work that some of the panelists are going to bring and share. Um, so to participate, you can either raise a hand and Jay will turn your microphone on. You can put questions or comments in the Q&A or you're welcome to use the chat. I'll be monitoring that. So and with that, and if you have any technical difficulties, reach out to Jay. He's absolutely amazing and here to support us as always. So with that, Raquel, I'll turn it over to you. And once you're done presenting, we'll come back and introduce the rest of the panel. Okay, thank you. I'm just gonna see if I can share my screen here and, and get my PowerPoint up there. It was, I was given some advice today to, um, to just have fun and, and uh, you know, in, in, in everything that we do, I thought, you know what, that is just some great advice. So if this takes longer than 20 minutes, but we have some laughs along the way and um, please uh, let's just have some fun with this. So thank you for that. I'm just going to see if I can share my slideshow. There we go. Okay, and I'm just going to move that. You can't see yourselves in the window, can you, if I just move the piece over? Someone will let me know if you can. Okay, so um, just thank you everybody for coming and allowing me to share my research on building community and social connection to support deep learning in asynchronous um, distance learning. It's, it's been an endeavor of mine for the past um, four plus years to, to really dive into this, this piece and the research aspect began last year. And so, so thanks for this opportunity to share, um, to share what I learned through um, hearing from teachers across the province. So um, just a bit of an introduction um, that when I first started um, researching distance learning, I was really curious about how to create the best distance learning environment for students. There was a lot of research on higher education about the importance of learning and community, but I thought there was there was little uh, regarding distance learning as I was experiencing it in the K-12 system. And so um, I remember through a professional learning seminar at the Saskatchewan Teachers Federation um, that Linda, who's one of our panelists tonight, she was facilitating. And it became so clear to me that there was such a strong constructivist approach being advocated for to support deep learning. Um, a constructivist, yes, but more so constructing understanding with community and through social interactions, collaborating, discussing. Um, but there was just little mention of, of how this could be done in distance learning. And so just the research on socially con constructed learning really um, spoke to me about the higher levels of achievement, higher levels of reasoning, um, the increased social and cultural perspectives. But um, Problematic was was um, just um, how to do this um, in asynchronous learning, and so even though my my research began prior to COVID, I'm finding the research to be timely um, because I'm expecting many educators to continue with some form of distance learning uh, post post pandemic. So. Um, you know, I, I knew there was going to be a wealth of experience to be learned from other teachers across the province, and I was just so fortunate um, to be able to do this research. I, it was such an honor to, to get to interview and, and um, have people share their experiences with me. There were 35 teachers across eight divisions um, who shared their experiences through an online survey. Um, 18 teachers from all those eight divisions um, followed up with one-on-one -on -one interviews. And so you'll see quotes from those teachers um, throughout this presentation as we go to really bring their voice to this, because what I'm sharing is, is the voices of, of the teachers as they've shared it with me. Not that the, not that the voices aren't um, diverse, and, and, um, but I, I'm sharing the, as they shared to me. So the purpose of this was just to explore how social constructivism um, was achieved. Um, what were teachers' experiences with creating those learning opportunities? Uh, what did they identify as best practices, and and how could the system be be strengthened? So um, 
before I just dive into to my research themes with the research, I just want to mention that um, the assessment strategies that teachers use to support deep learning, um, they were strategies used in face-to-face -face classrooms as well. Uh, there were projects, there were portfolios, mini teaching assignments, analysis of case studies, and I want to be able to do justice to those, so I'm going to be providing a handout. I'll, I'll get it out in the next two weeks that describes the strategies as teachers describe them to me. Um, just it would it would take so you know I'm not sure we could finish it if we went through all of their their pieces with the interviews but but know that I'm going to get that out to you in their voice so that you can hear some of that in there so for the purpose of this presentation I'm going to talk about those conditions and contexts that influenced um, their social constructive approach if that was something that they even used um, and, and not to give anything away here, but uh, there wasn't a simple answer of, you know, if I just do this, I'll have a strong learning community and, and social interactions in my distance learning courses that it, it wasn't as simple as that. I, I, I wish there were, a, you know, a one paragraph answer I could give you that would be the magic wand, but um, it was complex. And so that's sort of what I guess I want to mention is that sometimes I refer to distance learning as a learning ecosystem. Um, or this learning community where the students learning is supported by a network of connections and so too, um, you know, teachers are supported through that network of connections. Um, so, you know, the students influence the teachers, the teachers influence the students, um, the resources available influence the learning, the beliefs of the community influence how distance learning is supported. So if you hear me reference distance learning as a learning ecosystem or as a learning community, I'm, I'm really referencing the complexity and the interconnectedness um, of the system. So um, I used a thematic analysis approach to the data, which means that I was actively constructing themes to interpret the experiences teachers had shared. Um, and the three themes that I constructed from the surveys and interviews were the teacher's catalyst, student agency, and alignment between the school purpose, pedagogy, and the personal needs of the student. So um, the first one um, was the teacher's catalyst. And this theme was really constructed because I could see clearly from the interviews that seeing the teacher as a guide on the side or as a coach, it was just not sufficient to account for their interactive role in supporting deep learning. Um, I've taken some liberties with mixing both a chemical and biological catalyst in my metaphor. So my apologies to the purest chemists or biologists out there. Um, but um, I thought the metaphor was fitting. Um, and I saw the, the teacher as a catalyst in, in three different ways. And, and I'll just talk about those ways here as, as we go through this piece. So um, you'll notice that I've included the participant quotes throughout the slides and, and you know, here's one that, that really represents this piece here of, of reducing the unproductive struggle. Um, so the first line of support teachers spoke of focusing on was reducing the students' unproductive struggle in navigating and just being comfortable in this new environment. Um, they had to, um, they were using strategies like creating clear, consistent course design, um, making sure there was clear due dates, having a slow start to the semester so that they could scaffold the technology skills and that the students weren't overwhelmed with the being in this new learning environment and then having to learn the content. So that was a really big thing. They weren't just jumping straight into we're a learning community right now. They had to sort of, they had to get the student comfortable in the environment. And that's where the hedge maze of, of, of this particular quote stands out that, that, I, that I just love that piece. It's like if you made people walk through a hedge maze to get to the door of their school every day, wondering where they turn and, and thinking it's frustrating, that really stood out to me. And second, I saw ta teachers as catalyst to deep learning by creating that personalized learning path for students. And whether that was to encourage student advocacy, create choice, or create pause points for the students to gain and use the feedback to allow for that learning path to shift. Um, those were all keys to it. Student teacher partnerships were key here as well. And, and, and I hope these two quotes do that justice there, just where teachers advocated, if you wanna show me a different way, I'm open to it. And, and many teachers saying my go-to is giving them choice. I, you know, I have to expose them to a wide number of things first and they've gotta choose a couple that they wanna go deeper on. And of course, I guess that, you know, distance learning is just that perfect place to create that branched learning opportunity. Um, 
And then finally, I saw the teachers as a catalyst by um, strengthening the learning environment. So if you can think of the learning environment here, and I'm just using the circle as the learning environment, um, consider this first circle to represent the existing elements in the system. Uh, but once the, once the teacher gets to know the students, they often realize they need to add additional resources. This isn't sufficient. So this is part of that active role that the teachers are doing. And maybe it's advocating for additional technology. Maybe it's um, maybe they need an immersive reader. Maybe they need to add in additional case studies that relate to student interest. Um, maybe they need to connect some of the something that's going on in the student's personal life to how they can apply that to an assignment. Um, but beyond strengthening resources, which was a big piece of it, they spent much of their time actively strengthening the learning connections in the community, um, in the learning community. So, so this particular circle represents that. And part of supporting these connections, so these lines, these connections between all of the resources that we have in the ecosystem, in the environment, connecting all of those pieces, that might have been maybe we need to create a stronger connection with the parents and the distance learning school. So maybe that's where we need to, to focus our time. Maybe that's where teachers spent time focusing there. Um, and maybe it was in terms of um, really focusing on student engagement, because if we talk about student engagement and these connections, if the student isn't engaged, the teacher can add as many resources as they want into the learning environment. But in order for it to become this dynamic learning community, we need that student to be engaged um, as well with that piece. And so I'll just go a little bit more about it, the engagement piece and how that really supports these um, connections in here, because there were different types of engagement. And it was helpful once I was able to parse out, uh, parse out the different engagement people that, that teachers were targeting. A large amount of their time um, was spent on behavior engagement and, and understandably because students were learning to navigate the new environment. And again, they wasn't necessarily jumping straight into deep learning. They had to get that student used to the environment. So this was really, in, if you look at the strategies there in terms of um, clear due dates, exemplars, scaffolding the content, personal um, connections that really had to do with reducing that unproductive struggle. So that was a big target, but lots of students struggled with that to the point that it was difficult to, that might have been something they worked on with the student all semester. Um, emotional engagement, and this was an interesting one, sort of how they engaged students to be interested in the course and how to have that positive attitude about learning. And again, they're in this environment they don't, um, they're not used to. How do you do that in there? And um, and that was the same pieces we're talking about, um, encouraging student advocacy, having optional synchronous section, sessions, um, collaborating in some sort of way. And finally, there was that intellectual engagement where they were trying to um, in, in, um, get students engaged in investing in higher order thinking skills. Um, the key to that one I, I felt was um, scaffolding collaboration. If, the, if they had collaboration going on in there, they had to scaffold it to, to get to that intellectual engagement. And they really had to provide those pause points for feedback. Um, that, it, that it wasn't the self-pacing needed to have some limitations and pause points in there to really go, go forward with that piece. But it was interesting when teachers were talking about their role because often they were speaking in the behavior engagement piece in terms of getting used to it. Um, but really the deep learning started happening when you could see that they could get students in here and they started getting more and more excited about talking about their role as they were getting into the, the emotional engagement and intellectual engagement pieces in there. So I loved this quote from one of the teachers um, who said, if I'm bored and cringing when I have to mark an assignment, imagine how these kids must feel. It's a big sign I need to change something to make it interesting. And so I thought that one just exemplified um, the benefits to both the teacher and the student on increasing emotional engagement, but also noting that the emotional engagement seemed to increase the, their ability to um, for the student to be engaged intellectually and want to go deeper as well. So it was an interesting piece there. So maybe just the last point on um, using the catalyst as a metaphor is that the catalyst can only continue to be effective if it doesn't get used up in the reaction. So teachers commonly cited a workload that was causing burnout. Um, 
and teacher burnout, it affects student achievement. It affects the teacher's ability to support the collaboration and communication. Um, and that wasn't lost on me as I was hearing teachers share um, their experiences. So uh, teachers were noting areas where they were getting burnt out, including um, there was an increase in students because of COVID physical restrictions. That would, that would be one for sure. Um, but the other piece was that there was a lack of understanding of the time it took to communicate um, with students. And so um, part of that in terms of seeing the teacher as a catalyst and, and viewing the distance learning teacher as a catalyst, I think it has the potential to, to disrupt the perceptions of the static distance learning system where teachers are simply assignment markers. They were constantly busy um, trying to engage students, bring in resources, um, create new learning paths to engage students. Um, and, and both of these quotes really stood out to me here. And, and, and I've, I've come back to, to them often that the desire of every teacher at heart would love to be doing problem-based learning and collaboration and deep learning. All of us would love that, but the current workload, it just wouldn't be possible. It's too much. And, and the second one piece was that was a participant, another participant describing having 47 kids in one class is acceptable to them and referring to policymakers in an online class because, quote, you're not managing them in the classroom. So there was a real misperception about the role and what it what a teacher did. So that, that's just something to, to perhaps um, close off that particular theme. Um, the second theme was that of student agency. And, you know, it can't be overlooked that while the teacher, they definitely, they support the student, um, the student maintains agency within the system as they should. Student-led learning is part of that socially constructed learning that they are leading their learning. Um, but really what presented as problematic within the data was that students were often advocating for independent learning, which in turn strongly influenced the teacher's instructional choices. So um, they, well, I'll get to it later, but um, so I just determined from teachers' responses that student agency um, was influenced by their readiness for distance learning and their buy-in to socially constructed practices. And, and so if I, if I move over to that, um, readiness included independent skills such as time management and goal setting, technology skills, online interpersonal skills. And you know, I can imagine it. It follows that if students aren't going to be ad, students aren't going to be advocating for learning strategies that they don't have the necessary skills for. Um, and student buy-in was a was an interesting one as well. And there, in terms of teachers, noted that students didn't perceive the value in collaborative learning in social in social interactions for their learning. They believed they learned more independently. And um, they also cited that students had previous experience where group, meant, group work meant that one or two people did most of the work and that affected the motivation and created a dislike for collaborative work. Um, there was also um, that students often came into distance learning with the expectation that it was going to be independent. And so when, they, when the students um, express some resistance that because they were expecting it to be independent, teachers were finding when they removed the collaborative pieces from their courses that um, they the students, um, you know, they stayed in the course more. And, um, and finally, and this one came up a lot to the trust and safety with others they've never met. You know, it's it, difficult to communicate and collaborate with people you've never met um, in person. So the final theme um, was alignment between the school purpose, the pedagogy and the personal needs of the students. Um, so I just found this one, it was really interesting because there were such dichotomous perspectives throughout the province. So there were voices saying that they felt like it was such a privilege um, to be able to offer courses to students that they could work on at their own pace, that they could complete independently and um, in this way, social interactions with peers would have created an access barrier to education. So, so they really advocated for that independent piece. And then, you know, then you'd have another interview um, where teachers were um, expressing the opposite, saying how it was such a privilege to be able to offer distance learning rooted in that community and those social interactions where they were very supported in creating that learning community. So I really wrestled with these um, dichotomous approaches that were being advocated for. Um, at times, the community approach was what was defined as quality learning. And at other times, um, that was what was a barrier to access. So 
Um, that's where um, I noted that it was the alignment that created the confidence in that approach. And if you consider the diverse program purposes, pedagogies, and the personal student needs, of course, a homogeneous um, approach isn't going to be sufficient. But um, so I'll have a look. I've got three, three different um, studies with quotes from teachers here when the when there was an alignment between the program purpose, the pedagogy used, and the personal needs of the students. So in this particular case, and there's there's some quotes on on the underneath this one here. Um, in this case, the program was developed for the purpose for a very specific type of student, um, a student who was independent and needed self pacing. So the purpose, the pedagogy and the needs all align. Um, in this one, so for example, and I'll just read the quotes here, like we built it with the idea that it was a standalone course. This and meaning distance learning is not for everybody or this approach is not for everybody. So we wanna make the student aware you're doing this on your own. It's like you're a bit of a homeschooler or a part-time homeschooler. And the, but keeping in mind, keeping in mind this self-pacing is for that, that kid. And this is just one description of, of the type of student, that hockey kid that comes home after hockey practice. In the morning, he was at his home school. In the evening, in the afternoon, he was at the academy. And in the evening, he was supplementing his education with whatever subjects he's missing out on on face to face. So consider that, that, that that's a great alignment for the purpose pedagogy in person. And then the second one, um, similarly, so when the student needed a supportive learning community, the school was, and the school was designed to support that community, um, the teachers were very confident that that approach was going to, was meeting students' needs. Um, this was, this was a, one example of a case. This was a unique case, but similar advocacy. The class would meet as a whole group on Mondays and Fridays just to see who's showing up and who seems to be engaged. Then on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they're independent and, and the teacher is usually reaching out to kids who are inactive, um, asking questions, maybe setting up small group, group meetings for whoever needs it. It was a very flexible piece and community and collaborative um, in that piece. And they advocated and said this, this was great. Students could be have that flexible self-paced within the week, but still be able to stay connected. Um, this is this is just one last one here of, of an alignment between the program purpose, the pedagogy and the needs. And um, so this was when the primary purpose of the course was to meet the needs of, say, a full time distance learning student. Teachers often used an activity based approach to learning where they focused efforts on field trips, volunteerism, work placement. And in that context, teachers were actively looking to create opportunities for peer interactions to give students as normal a high school experience as possible. Um, this, what, this particular um, participant described a win winter camping trip. Um, others described different types of organizations like that. Um, and talking about these opportunities are similar to what our community of students, um, how they feel connected with other people similar in their face to face. So th those were areas where there was an alignment. Now where there was a misalignment, um, well, I've got about, I've got three, two cases here where there's a misalignment where, that I'll talk about. And um, many teachers described that distance learning programs were not designed to meet the new, the needs of students who had specific academic um, needs or ready or had needed readiness support um, where students needed connection for engagement. Um, they described programs that weren't designed to meet students needs and that's where the disconnect came in. So um, for example, maybe the program purpose is set up for students who were unsuccessful face to face, maybe that was for credit credit recovery. And then they're moving into a course that they're doing independent and it's self paced, but they have significant academic or readiness support um, needs, and they need that connection for motivation and, and this one, you know, particular um, teacher, you know, goes on to say that tracking those students is, is quite stressful. So that's a disconnect there. Um, another disconnect happened here where you have a program purpose that's meant to meet the needs of diverse students, you know, people who have independent learning needs and some who want to learn as a community, but that the pedagogy uses is independent. And 
what I'm noting here when I was hearing teachers describe their experiences was that um, the approach was fine for some students, but it didn't work for other students. There was a disconnect for some. And so, you know, this is where teachers spoke of distance learning not being for everybody. And specifically, I would interpret that to be that not all distance learning approaches are for everybody. And so just to piggyback on that and give a bit of data from the from the survey, 55% um, of the teachers um, in the survey believe that collaborative learning is needed for deep understanding. Uh, but 73% of the teachers indicated that it's not a realistic goal um, in distance learning. And so that was just an interesting piece that stood out to me and about why it wasn't um, why it wasn't a realistic goal. Um, and equally in there, just teachers who needed an independent approach for some students, they did default to using it for all, I shouldn't say default, they, they used it for all students. If they needed independent for some students, they used it for all students. And, um, and certainly as referenced earlier, it seems logical. If teachers have heavy workloads, using one approach is going to, it's gonna create efficiencies in the system and that, that makes sense. Um, but I, I would just suggest that it's worth considering whether collaboration is not realistic because we're using an independent approach, or are we using a an independent approach because collaboration isn't realistic? I'll say that again. It's a bit of a chicken in the egg piece that, that I'm talking about. So is collaboration not realistic because we're using an independent approach, or are we using an independent approach? because collaboration isn't realistic. It's, it's just a subtle shift. And, and I just wanna suggest that we can disrupt that cycle and really make sure that, that there's an alignment in all of those pieces. And so this is a quote that came from a teacher who was um, considering their role in shaping distance learning practices if they continued with um, COVID, or sorry, with distance learning post pandemic. Um, so if online learning remains past COVID, we don't want to just be a purely asynchronous model. We need to really look at this and make a new way where I can do group discussions with my students. I can get them to interact with each other and work live with each other in a shared digital space. Those are really cool things in the curriculum and I need to assess those skills. It's part of the social connection they need. Um, so the, I thought that just resonated with me in, in there. And, and I, I probably the piece that resonated with me was we really need to look at this and make a new way. So talking about the asynchronous piece may not have been effective for them moving forward or for that particular um, teacher moving forward. So I'll just summarize um, how each theme creates that holistic understanding. And this is where I said there just isn't a one size fits all answer. Um, that the teacher is catalyst, um, the teacher is catalyst theme, it provides that in-depth understanding of the teacher's role in catalyzing social constructivist learning. The student agency theme addresses the student's active role in influencing the ecosystem and how the system is structured. And that alignment um, piece addresses the necessity of seeing distance learning from a holistic perspective, like connectedness is at the heart of the system. And uh, I have a, a bit more to go on in terms of recommendations. I know I'm going long, um, but I just would ask you to consider um, your role in the ecosystem as well. You can't do it all, right? If you're a teacher, you can't do it all. If you are a, a, a school leader, you can't do it all as a student. So really just considering what your role is in a system, if you're part of a distance learning ecosystem, social connections to deepen learning, they can't be mandated they really have to be supported and the roles need to align, the catalyst teacher, the student agency and, and the environment. But, but on top of that, nothing in that ecosystem is static. Skills can be learned, attitudes can shift, support can change and, and viewing distance learning in that holistic ecosystem, it can really have those transformative benefits. So I know I'm going long and I don't want to rush. I'm, I'm still having fun with this. I don't know if you're all having fun. I don't know what you're doing there, but um, I'm just going to, as though I look up at my screen and can see, but um, I just want to mention four areas um, that, that I interpreted where um, that would be supportive of social constructivists that might support social constructivists in, dis, in asynchronous distance learning. And, and I would just suggest that the asynchronous cohort might be a model that's overlooked where it works. Um, uh, 
where teachers were pacing their students as cohorts, um, teachers cited an increase in opportunity for social for um, supporting critical discussions, and they spoke less about their role in tracking inactive students as well. Um, they had more peer feedback, peer led learning and dialogue occurred um, when they had that cohort paced um, piece. Um, the other piece I'd just suggest is pause points. And I know this, that I'm not sure how this sounds to, to anybody else, but it was something that really came across that teachers shared experiences suggesting that the free for all student led pacing is insufficient for peer to peer collaborative for peer to peer collaborative engagement. Um, and at times that free for all student pacing was a barrier to deep learning. Um, really just think of the student who can complete as much of a course, you know, completes much of a course within the last two weeks. Um, the teachers commenting on that that um, that the students shouldn't be allowed to bypass the deep learning process and that, that receiving and using feedback is is part of the teaching and learning cycle that that shouldn't be avoided um, in a self paced environment. Um, the other piece here um, that I would just suggest is is schools can expect that students will not come to DL with all the necessary skills to six to succeed and uh, I've got a, a quote from some researchers, Rotherham and Willingham. Um, if we deem that such skills as collaboration and self-direction are essential, we really need to be launching a concerted effort to study how they can be taught, um, rather than uh, assuming that if, if we mandate them that they're going to result in students learning them. So uh, it, that's where this comes from, interpreting that the acquisition of those deep learning skills need to be explicitly taught, especially when that's where teachers were citing that students just didn't have the readiness skills when they came. Certainly there were pre-courses and then teachers mentioned that pre-courses helped, um, but it wasn't the end all be all. It didn't, it didn't, um, didn't mean they had them in there. Um, and yeah, just final on this slide here was just looking for those shared learning spaces where teachers can see the thinking of other, where students can see the thinking of others, um, learn from others and support the thinking. Like where teachers spoke of collaborative digital spaces, um, they spoke of just simply of how seeing others work helped shape their own thinking. Um, and sometimes that shared learning space included face-to-face -face interactions, um, teacher visits, field trips, work experience, um, and again, the community service and field trips weren't widely used, but where they were used, teachers cited positive learning outcomes. They farm to table tours, camping, community service. They were great ways to incorporate that where it wasn't necessarily um, in the traditional way that you would think that it's peer to peer in a discussion board. So final things, and I wanted to let um, teachers' voices really shine through here that targeting that emotional engagement strategy um, catering to student interests and experiences was really something that that teachers um, they spoke so positively about um, that the students wanted to go deeper when they had um, assignments that they were interested in and and this quote just stood out to me. Um, I've always believed that making personal connections to concepts is important, but I start to think it's even more important during distance learning. I think we have to work twice as hard to engage students because when they're at home, they could just as easily being engaged in their favorite hobbies, TV shows, or video games. So, um, yeah, I think I've got a, a, just a, two more teacher quotes on here. This, this rest, if there was one thing that came from this, and I don't know, I mean, if I had a magic wand, if, when I asked people what their magic wand was, that, that was my last question in the, in the interviews was, you know, if you had a magic wand, what would you do? And this quote resonates what many teachers um, shared. If the province had a formal process to build and share resources, teachers could be guided by some of those exemplary practices, exemplary resources, exemplary projects, so that each teacher isn't spending thousands of dollars in teachers pay teachers, buying their own resources, sharing amongst ourselves in a closet or Google Drive secretly. So um, resource help, bring it on. Um, and this and uh, just this last piece here really um, resonates with taking things off of teachers' plates. So too did the provincial hub, but taking things off of teachers' plates. If if you're, um, you know, somebody from a, a a lead in your system, if anywhere we can take things off teachers' plates that take away from the teacher's ability to support social interactions and community the better. And so some of those pieces that teachers talked about that they had that that were great were automated progress reports to parents, students and support persons that took 
so much off of um, teachers who spoke of that. Um, and strong intervention policies to support inactive or struggling students. Um, there were schools that spoke of their strong intervention policies. And, and it sounded like as I, you know, even as I was talking to teachers, it was like, oh gosh, you know, they have a great, you know, of course I couldn't share, um, you know, who's saying what, but it's like, oh, there are just some, there are some great peace things going on in this province. Um, just some really great things that I think people could go from. And, and this just really resonated with me, this teacher comment. I'm making 20 phone calls that never get answered. My voicemails are never returned. My emails are never answered. That constant repeating of trying to get in touch with someone was a major, major, major part of my job. So if we can take that off of teachers' plates to help and so that they have more time for supporting that community learning. This really is my last slide beside my thank you slide. And I would just say, although beyond the scope of this study, um, many teachers reported just a drastic increase in students with anxiety who were enrolling in their distance learning courses. Um, just something that really needs to be explored further, absolutely. And further, I would suggest that research on implementation of collaborative work needs to, needs to happen. Um, the number of teachers who cited that not only students' previous negative experience with collaborative work, but that they also had negative experience with group work. Um, it suggests that there's areas for improvement in that implementation stage. Okay, I'm 15 minutes over. I don't know what to do here, Ellen. You can't take it back, but I had fun sharing this, but I'm, I'm open to questions, but uh, I would love to hear from our panelists um, as well. I think what we primarily do, Raquel, is we applaud madly. That's what I want to do right now. <laughs> so perhaps what we will do before we start getting to questions, and I would enc encourage those of you who are participants in the session or those of you who are panelists to feel free to put questions into the chat as we go through this. But what I'd like to do right now is I would like each of the members of the panel to have a couple of minutes to just introduce themselves and to share their own interest and connection in distance learning. So perhaps we can start um, from the, with the person who's currently furthest away from us. So, so Michael, if you'd be willing to give yourself a quick introduction and just share a bit about, what, about why you're here. Uh, sure, not a problem. Uh, I'm also, I think, the only one that jumped on camera right away. Uh, looking at the folks around the room. Um, so I'm Michael Barber. I'm an associate professor of instructional design at Toro University of California in lovely Vallejo. And uh, although I'm originally from Newfoundland, and um, so I've been involved with K-12 distance online and blended learning now for just over two decades. Um, and I started off as a teacher and course designer and have done just about everything else since from researcher, evaluator, administrator, um, professional development provider, external consultant, you name it. Um, so that's sort of where I've come from and, and my background. Thank you, Michael. We're so pleased you were, were free to join us tonight. Um, Dirk, did you want to go next? I'd be delighted. Thank you. Um, so my name is Dirk Morrison, and I'm an associate professor at the College of Education. University of Saskatchewan, and I'm a graduate chair in uh, curriculum studies and also director of the recently uh, op just opened the uh, uh, Jane and Ron Graham Center for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. Um, I'm also um, Raquel's supervisor. And so I've been with Raquel through this journey and and I can I can recall the the very conversation we had in a in a restaurant talking about her idea for what she might like to pursue in terms of her phd and whether she should pursue her phd and i've been a i've been a supporter and a fan of raquel's work and and what she's shared with you tonight is um a little more than the tip of the iceberg but you get the idea that uh, raquel has really dug into some very important concepts and some very important uh, possibilities around policy and and how we do DL in the province of Saskatchewan and and uh, lots to learn for beyond. So I've got lots of else I could say, but I'll pass the baton to the next uh, to the next person. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk. Linda, can you introduce yourself, please? 
Hi, I'm Linda Aspen Baxter, and I'm an associate director at Saskatchewan Teachers Federation Professional Learning. That is a very big mouthful. Um, and I am very honored to support planning work and facilitation work with the e learning cohort, uh, the foundations of teaching cohort, and, and others. But those are the ones that have applicability to my work that I've been able to do with Raquel and with others. And so I've been, um, it's been an incredible year of learning with Raquel as we have done work in the foundations of teaching and as we've done work with the e-learning cohort. So um, I'm just so thrilled to be here with you tonight, Raquel, and you absolutely rocked your presentation. Just kudos to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate appreciate your presence enormously. So as I said, feel free to raise your hand or to put questions or comments either into the Q&A or into the chat. But I'd just like to start with, with a question that I, I thought I'd offer first to Raquel and then invite the other panelists to jump in as well. Um, Raquel indicated that my other role at the STF is as a research and policy analyst. And one of the things that I hear in my world is this idea of, of um, blanket criteria or standards or all of those kind of things, ensuring there's, there's quality assessment. And, and I got to tell you, all of those words kind of make me a little bit batty because I listened to something like what Raquel just said and thinking about deep learning, thinking about meaningful connection, thinking about the different ways that, 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 that deep learning can happen. So I guess my question to you, Raquel, and that I would invite the other panelists to wait into is, how do we shift the conversation away from this idea of standardization and criteria and all of that to really good quality pedagogy and meaningful engagement? What are some of the ways we can start to move even those policy conversations away from, from, from the things that are easy to measure to the things that are really hard to measure, but probably a lot more meaningful. So do you, are you getting where I'm going with this? Uh, well, I think so, but I, I'm, I think so. So in terms of um, standardized testing, and, and, I, and I guess I'll speak from, from the experience of, of when I was interviewing um, the teachers and, and doing the research and in talking to others, um, standardized testing, I have to say, is not part of um, it's not part of my um, conversation. I, I actually rarely have a conversation about that. And I don't know um, if that's because we've moved away from it, but we really were talking. Um, we weren't talking so much about standardized testing, but maybe what I'll cover within the question that you talked about was, was qual how do we know it's quality? That's something that I often hear. Well, we need quality assurance with distance learning. We need to know what makes this a quality course. What, you know, and we're always, we always at, or, or I feel like as distance learning teachers, um, there can sometimes be a need for, for us to defend to others um, why this is a quality and certainly you can find lots of, of things on you know people talking about you know some of the myths about distance education um, and breaking those down that it's not a static um, piece it's not a static course um, in terms of those particular pieces and I always shift that piece back to just making sure that we are talking about um, how do I want to say this that the quality education is embedded within the curriculum, regardless of the mode that it comes out in. And that was really ever present in the conversations. And I think when I prefaced that at the beginning by saying, I just wanna say, I'm gonna send you out the strategies that teachers talked about, but just know the strategies were actually the same strategies you would see in, in, uh, in your great classrooms as well. They didn't differ, but the environment differed. So how do I build that communication? How do I get to them? So um, I know because it's a new environment, people wanna know what, what makes this a quality uh, piece, what makes this a quality course. Um, and I would suggest it's those exact same things um, that do so in in face to face um, to do that. And, and that's part of sort of breaking down and making these are all the hidden things that go on in distance learning to make this quality piece happen. And I think it's just that they're hidden and there's there's maybe some myths and some stereotypes about 
about what goes on um, in there. But but I'd love to hear um, I'd love to hear the other panelists' um, take on that. Thank you for that. Who'd like to jump in? Well, I just want to add to what Raquel um, said, and we were actually talking about this last night, because I think that what is very clear is that everything we know about quality pedagogy in a face-to-face -face classroom is important for online classrooms as well. So as Raquel said, it's the environment that shifts. And that was my aha uh -huh when I was first introduced to online learning and online facilitation because I made it to be this huge thing that was so frightening. And when I realized that I could bring with me everything that I did face to face, but I had to think about a different environment, it wasn't the diversity in terms of identity and need and interest of students was the same. Curricular content was the same. Um, and what we know about impactful learning was the same. I had to think about a different environment. There's another piece to what you were saying though, Ellen, that I'd like to add to this. And that is my worry about standards um, is that it sees teachers as technicians rather than as professionals who are responding to the learning needs of the students in their classroom and who are uh, interacting with them, not to deliver learning, but to actually be the catalyst within a learning environment that creates learning opportunities with students and, and works alongside them. So I think there's a piece in there about technician versus teacher as professional as well. Thank Hi. you, Linda. Dirk? Ellen, yeah. Um, and this is, I want to bring Raquel <clears throat> back into the conversation. Um, so I guess when, you were talking about the the resource hub, and you was you were like, "Bring it on, right, Raquel?" And and that was kind of the a big big takeaway uh, was that teachers would really really love to have a set of resources. Now, in those resources, I think you were talking about uh, epitome examples, right, um, or uh, you know, really high quality. Um, examples of course designs or of technology use or of success of with a particular pedagogical uh, uh, tactic or, or what have you. Um, so I think back to your question, we're, we're really coming back full circle. So what is quality? Well, we'd have to answer the question, which projects or which elements from what we're calling epitome or best practices or whatever label, but like the best of the best, we've somehow used criteria to select which are the best of the best. And we have to ask ourselves, what are those criteria? So I, Ellen, back to your point, I don't have any problem as an instructional designer of in the past, having worked uh, with faculty and discussed, you know, the instructional design of the course. I think for me, it does come down to the design uh, where so many multiple factors have to be considered um, in terms of the overall design of a DL. And I think Raquel's uh, data here and her findings are really important because the alignment was, was a piece I think that has been missing from the literature as far as I know. I don't know, Michael, what, what your take is on that, but uh, anyway, I'll stop there, but that's just my comment. Michael? Well, actually, I, I'm going to disagree with a little bit of what's been said. Um, personally, I've got no problem with, with standards whatsoever. In all honesty, if we don't have standards, we don't have anything to measure something against. And you know, I think it's the nature of the standards that we've had to date that have been problematic, particularly around K-12 distance and online learning. Um, I look at the, uh, the national standards movement that we've seen in the US that was originally spearheaded by the, the Southern Regional Educational Board and then taken over by INACO and now it's the Virtual Leadership Learning Alliance or something like VLLA is the group in charge of it in partnership with Quality Matters. 
And uh, when you look at what they've got there, I mean, it becomes this minute checklist of things that oftentimes represents what the organizations that put them out were involved with and not good pedagogy. You know, if you think about the way standards are supposed to be developed, you know, you basically, the first thing that you do is you go through and, and, and you look through the literature to find out what the research has found to be effective in a particular domain, discipline, field, what have you. And then you try to put those things into measurable statements that would end up in some form of a rubric. Then you give that rubric to a bunch of people, tell them to watch the same person doing something and see if they all score it the same way. If they don't, then you've got to go back to the drawing board and make revisions to the rubric until you get to a point where there's some level of integrated reliability. You know, but if the four of us sit down with a sheet of paper that has a bunch of statements that say, according to the research, we found that if they do X, Y, and Z in an online class or in the way in which they design an online program or the way in which online students are supported at the local level, that they're going to have success. And all four of us have the same pattern of ticks on that rubric, then standards are perfect. And, and in all honesty, something that we should strive for. Uh, the problem is, is that we rarely take the time to go through the process of getting to that stage in the first place. Usually it's some consultant comes in, um, watches something for a very short period of time, develops some sort of scale, gives it to the organization or the ministry, the ministry adopts it and then sends it out with minimal amounts of training for the people that are using it. And you get completely haphazard results across the board and something that has no validity or reliability whatsoever in terms of being a useful tool. Um, the other thing I, I want to disagree with is, is this, um, I, I think it was Linda, although it might have been Raquel, I can't remember who said it, but this idea that good teaching is good teaching. Um, I, in all honesty, if that was the case, the past 20 months would have been like the 20 months previous to that, to be perfectly honest with you. You know, if good teachers were good teachers, regardless, we would have had a seamless transition into the remote learning that we've all experienced over the past two school years. I guess we're into the third school year now that's, that's been impacted by it. And the reality is that isn't the case. There are many differences between what constitutes a good classroom teacher and what constitutes a good online teacher. Um, and all you have to do is basically walk into any hybrid or virtual classroom of someone who isn't employed by an online program in the past you know, three school years to see just how little translates from one environment to the other. Um, I know I sort of took us off the rails there, but I think that's an interesting point. And, and I actually want to pull in a question from the question and answer that or the Q&A that kind of pulls that out a little bit. Um, so I, I, I mean, I think there is some real connections between online learning and classroom learning. If you know, we're using the same curriculum. Um, there's a lot of similar training. Pedagogy is very important. Connections very important. But the question in the Q&A is, is what should we be taking and celebrating as unique in the online environment and nurturing in the online environment that would perhaps let us let go of some of the things that were developed as 19th, 20th century face-to-face -face kind of things? What are some of those things that we could really, um, that, that, that are allowable in the online environment that might not be in face-to-face? -face? Um, who wants to go first on that? All right, I'll take her. <laughs> yeah, um, really when we when I look at this in terms of distance learning, there are some pieces here. Um, the ability to connect with the community and what interests student, and I spoke of that branched learning piece, and that's really a, a that's a transition that when we're building our distance learning courses and in the course design, it's something that presents itself as um, a benefit in distance learning to be able to do that without having to have, you know, my 25 students in front of me or however many students I have in front of me and, and explaining, you know, where we're going and leading the, 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 the path for the whole students. I can have that different 
the students can choose their different path. And maybe that means there's a lot of front end work in terms of making um, different videos, making different instructions, scaffolding it the different way. But part of that is, is building the inquiry process for the students, building their critical thinking skills, bringing that. And that's, that's the same in, in either class. So I would say the learning path is one. Um, um, I was just going to talk about gamification, not that that's something that I that I um, do a ton of, and you can still do that type of a, a piece in, in face to face, but um, just being able to um, get engaged in that different way outside of the four walls of your classroom. Now that we've had a, a bit of a positive aspect to it, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll jump in again. Um, not that it's necessarily a negative thing. I think probably the biggest thing that, that distance and online learning provides an opportunity to do that the face-to-face -face environment doesn't is provide truly individualized instruction. And I say it that way, provides an opportunity to, because in all honesty, I've seen very few individuals that actually have both the technical knowledge of what the learning management system provides them, as well as an understanding of the data that it collects to be truly be able to do that. Um, and some of this is at the, the teacher level, but most of it, in all honesty, is at the programmatic level. You know, online programs can set up all sorts of alerts within their learning management system that indicate, you know, wh whether a student has spent X amount of time or X number of days on a particular piece of content. Um, they can analyze data over time to figure out that, you know, if, if students tend to have trouble with lesson 37, it's usually a predictor of whether or not they're going to have success in the course. Um, but we rarely use these type of analytics that the system provides us, um, both at a programmatic level and at a teacher level. Um, when I sit down and do professional development with online teachers, one of the first things I always do with them is to see how much they know about what statistics the LMS actually uh, collects and whether or not they know how to go and get it. Um, even at the university level, most of the faculty that I work with um, and, and my main role at the university here is, is faculty development. Um, I'll sit down with faculty to see if they know where to find if a student has clicked on a piece of content. Um, because if you're expecting them to know X and they haven't even read the lesson or you know, watched the video that X is described, you know, unless they already knew that before they started the course, chances are they're not going to know what in the world you're talking about. Um, you know, so there's a lot that we can do with the online environment, um, but most of it usually doesn't get tapped. Uh, you know, part of it is programmatic. Um, part of it is just teachers don't know. And that, that falls upon us, both in terms of the professional development that the programs provide, but also the teacher education that we provide to in-service and pre-service teachers when they're with us at the university. Oh geez, Mike, uh, can we can we clone you and uh, bring you to the U of S? It'd be great to have that kind of uh, uh, detailed support. I, I don't have too much to add, really, other than you know I think I think what it allows us to do uh, are to shake up shake up the the whole foundation of of education in in some ways. I mean, not to wax too rhetorical here, but you know DL. Uh, is often the first in to use what you know some folks would call disruptive technologies, et cetera. And, um, uh, and but some of these dovetail really nicely with some of the pedagogy that we want to try to approach, such as collaborative online learning and some of the technologies that we have available to us now, even the one we're using here today, allows fairly seamless asynchronous uh, communication. And you know, uh, Michael, you you been around long enough to know that that wasn't true 20 years ago or 10 years ago even. And so, you know, the adoption of these technologies in our everyday lives, I think, is also going to have an impact on how we do uh, distance learning online and how we collaborate. We, we might become uh, more and more used to it. And I wanted to add to that, I think it's, it's so important for us to, to measure the success of a DL course or a DL innovation by doing some research, by doing some taking some action research uh, uh, endeavors, and or and really really getting 
down into uh, asking your students and evaluating the course and, and doing a thorough job of that. And that's, again, as Michael uh, discussed about some, some pieces of instructional design that don't get done because they take too much time, the evaluation of what we're doing takes time as well, but it's, it can be very uh, rewarding and effective. And we can grow incrementally, I think, too, in terms of our knowledge, but enough of me. Thank you, Dirk. Um, Linda, I don't know if, do you wanna wait in here? If Linda's still thinking, I'm gonna pop this in because I can see Linda writing her her brain, her burrow was frowning and she was writing in the, in, in that piece. Um, I was just gonna add on, on this piece, just it, it came in here. First of all, I'm loving the chat. If anybody's participating in the chat here, there's some there's some great things going on uh, in the chat. You know, uh, uh, I wanted to just comment just on on the piece of of what we might take, um, what distance learning can offer that's unique, but also just to, to comment. Um, you know, in in the in the research interviews when I was talking to teachers, uh, they certainly mentioned that that it was not pedagogically sound to take what you did face to face and put it online. They, they realized that quite, quite, quite quickly, <laughs> that it wasn't gonna work. Um, but what was very interesting that I'm hearing um, more from teachers post my research, so, so not as part of the research, is that um, these resources that they had built for pandemic are really enhancing their face to face. So it is, it is really an interesting piece how it's, possible that you know putting your face-to-face -face stuff up and just you know posting things online as you had them face-to-face -face, it, it is not pedagogically sound however interesting that the structure of inside a learning management system or the resources that you created for your distance learning works so well to create um uh, a more individualized path in your classroom. So just just noting that there's there's a shift of not so much you know necessarily what we can take from the classroom. I mean yes, but but it's really what can the face to face classroom take from distance learning as well. There's there's a piece the shift uh, in both of those there. And Raquel caught me furrowing my brow and thinking because Raquel, I was I would invite you to speak a little bit more about something that has been the subject of many planning conversations between you and I, and that's the idea from teacher directed to teacher supported learning. Um, and I'm going to invite you to speak about that because it originated from this research. Can you repeat the question, Linda? <laughs> Um, I was when I was thinking about what does online learning um, provide um, that is a benefit that's valuable. I think about what emerged from your research, the conversations that we've had about from teacher directed to teacher supported learning, and I'm thinking about the framework that we have talked about, and that emerged directly from this research. And because it's your research, I would invite you to speak about that because I think that's a very real value uh, and something that emerged from, from distance learning. Yeah, well, thanks for that, Linda. Um, yeah, I would, as you guys, I really would say that, you know, I think that's really part of, of the piece. And that's part of when we were breaking down social constructivism, when I break it down, and, and I know everybody's going to use a different term that was just, that's, that's, that's the term that I think it can, can encompass it. Um, part of that was student led. So I break it down into four areas, student led learning, collaborative learning, deep learning tasks, and um, Oh, I missed it. I started saying them in the wrong order of, of my wheel. I've got uh, um, collaborative, student-led, deep learning tasks, and oh my gosh. Okay, this is, we're going to have fun with this, and, and I missed that last one. It, 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 it'll come to me here. Um, but as we're going into those pieces, 
that's the piece that teachers were really talking about in terms of really wanting their students to lead the learning and building that piece of leading the learning. But it didn't just happen. They didn't just jump into being able to lead their learning. And, and you could see that in teachers' responses in there, even in the survey questionnaire when, um, you know, there was questions where I was asking dichotomous questions about which approach are you more comfortable? And one was perhaps a more individual approach or a teacher-led approach, and one was more a student-led approach. And um, I could see teachers weren't comfortable perhaps picking between the dichotomous approaches. So because there were lots of comments in the open comments on the, on the survey on that particular piece. And, and what they were saying was that in order to let students lead the way, they need to be scaffolded to do that. And really when we have our face-to-face um, what, what we're in face to face, the teacher is leading the learning, right? You've got the bell schedule that goes, you've got the teacher that says, okay, it's time to start working now. Um, there's always something directing the student as to where to go. So the student actually never has to take that stance of um, wondering or of, of um, acting for themselves to make those, those decisions. And then, and that was one of the quotes I think I probably pulled out of this presentation was where people had said, um, they've had that support removed from them. And we can't expect that they have these independent skills when the independents may have been relying very heavily on a face-to-face -face person to nudge, to nudge them into those pieces. But the, the teachers who really spoke about this in a um, collaborative, collaborative approach and getting students to do some innovative things. They were, they were doing um, sharing collaborative documents, book clubs, um, those types of things, book clubs with parents. Um, when they were doing those types of things, they had to scaffold it and it didn't happen right off the hop, right? So they were in there and it would be you and me, right? One-on-one. -on -one. So student and I are going to have some online conversations Then I'm going to partner the students up um, in pairs. And then I'm going to ask them how that went. And, you know, some of the teachers, you know, I remember one conversation the teacher shared with me, the students said it was horrible. You know, they were like, it was horrible. So-and-so isn't participating. They're not doing whatever. And then the teacher just came back with it. And, you know, it wasn't that we were giving up. This was anticipated that this was going to take a while to get students to lead this. We weren't just going to be able to say, you need to lead your learning and let it go. We had to scaffold those skills to get there. Thank you, Raquel, and thank you, Linda. So going through the chat, I want to pull in some of what's happened with COVID. And I know, Raquel, your research was not intended to be done during COVID. It was just kind of a happy or something coincidence. But I do wonder, you know, we've had here in Saskatchewan, pretty much every teacher has now had an opportunity to attempt some form of online learning. And we were just talking about what we might pull from distance learning that could support the classroom. I guess I wonder if you can reflect on it as a group and, and any of you who want to jump in on this, what is gonna be the impact of having had so many teachers and so many students now have some sort of experience with distance learning or online learning as we hopefully start to move forward out of the pandemic? What can we learn from that? And, and what will be some of the ways that that impacts both distance learning and classroom teaching? If no one else wants to jump in, I don't mind going first on this one because um, folks in the field, and, and I see this time and time again, regardless of where I am, and I do a lot of work uh, both you know, throughout North America, but also internationally. And whenever I'm in a room of folks that have been involved in distance and online learning or blended learning, um, they all see this as the great opportunity because now everyone's had to do this and they see how difficult it is so because of that you know we're going to get all this respect and such and such and they're going to you know all just realize the need for us to do this and then i actually look at what i'm seeing in the media and, and what i'm seeing from the other well if you look at the canadian statistics the other 94 percent if you look at the american statistics about the other 92 percent of folks that don't have any involvement with online learning prior to March 2020. And for them, what they've experienced in the last 20 months, at least in their minds, has been absolute crap compared to what they think they got when they were in the face-to-face -face environment. So I honestly believe that 
this presents not an opportunity, but it's probably going to be one of the greatest challenges that we've had in the field, because now, before at least we were able to work under the assumption that no one knew exactly what we were doing. So they didn't know if it was good, bad, or ugly. Now everyone just assumes that all online learning looks like what they've experienced in the last 20 months, which, you know, for those of us in the field, we know that, you know, what we were doing in September of 2019 was far superior to even what, you know, the, the, the most um, crafty of teachers who have picked it up in the past 20 months are able to do today. Um, just because, you know, we were prepared for it, we planned for it, we were using content that had been well thought out and designed in a purposeful manner, and we actually had time to do these things. Um, but what most people have experienced hasn't been that sort of that type of online learning. And I think we're going to get a really negative blowback because of that. Um, I think once the pandemic has passed, um, I honestly believe that you will see online learning levels drop to levels that were lower than what would have been normally in 2019, 2020, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, Ontario is actually probably a great example of this because it was only, well, the exactly one year before the pandemic happened that they announced that they were going to require initially four and then in November of 2020 or 2019 changed it to two online courses in order to graduate from high school. And now you've got, you know, an entire population in Ontario that has experienced absolutely horrible online learning, absolutely even worse uh, hybrid learning with the model that they've decided to use there. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not going to be pretty for us in the field. At least that's my prediction. Thank you for that, Michael. I appreciate particularly that wider perspective. Um, Linda, would it be okay if I call on you a little bit? I know you've done an incredible amount of work supporting teachers in the field over the last 18 months, you in particular, but also STFPL generally. And I guess I'd ask what you're seeing from the field here. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm curious if the trends are mirroring some of what Michael's seeing as broader trends, or are you seeing something a bit different here in Saskatchewan in terms of what you see as the impact of what's going to happen um, as we start to shift back into permanently into the classroom as have, having had teachers had this experience? Well, <laughs> Raquel, I'm going to ask you to dive in here too, because you were involved in, in some of that. I think the greatest thing we see right now with anything that we're offering professional learning wise is, and, and what we can only surmise is that teachers are exhausted. Um, and so the uptake for professional learning sessions that we saw happening last spring uh, is not happening this fall. So last, last spring, and I'm not sure if this is answering your question, Ellen, but, but last spring, we did a um, series of sessions after school for, say, 90 minutes once a week, and we would break out professional learning over, say, four or five weeks, and teachers were coming. And in fact, we were able to, um, it addressed some equity issues because we were able to address learning needs of teachers who, who would not be able to come, say, to Saskatoon for a face-to-face -face session. So those kinds of sessions were working last spring. What we're finding this fall is it's very different. So we've tried the same kind of thing and those after school sessions are tending not to run um, because we don't have enough participants to run them. What we're finding is the ones that are running tend to be the full day sessions when people are, are accessing subs, but we also know that, that there is there aren't enough subs available either. So um, our interpretation of it is that teachers are exhausted, their plates are full, they're trying to survive. Um, they still got students that are out for periods of time who have to isolate before they can come back. So they've got kids who are learning from home, they've got kids who are learning in the classroom, which increases the demand in the classroom. Um, Raquel, do you want to add to anything? Because we've done some sessions as well. No, on that on that particular <laughs> on that note, 
Help me. <laughs> Dirk, you have a Yeah, I just I just had a question for for Linda. So um, in terms of in terms of support structures or systems that are in place for let's say over stressed out teachers, right? Who who access whatever services are available to them. Are there any considerations for say so a, 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 Raquel, you said that almost all teachers felt that they were already overworked, right? And then of course during COVID that that is even increased because now they're they're help you know plopped into an environment that they know nothing about. So the levels of stress that many teachers must have experienced over this last couple of years. Uh, I'm just wondering, has that been factored into supports for oh. teachers? Yes, definitely, definitely. Awesome. There's been, um, we've provided or tried to provide a lot of support in terms of teacher wellness um, and in terms of the overwhelm that everyone is, is experiencing. Something uh, that Raquel spoke about in terms of students needing to, their, their learning needing to be scaffolded, that they need to learn the skills of being able to collaborate online, to be able to engage in different ways online. We're finding the same thing has happened with teachers in our sessions and that we have needed to be, to, to provide a lot of support because while teachers might have been expected to do some online learning, there are teachers who also um, need support in terms of those skills and feeling comfortable in an online space. And so they need as much scaffolding as what, as what students might need. Um, and there are teachers who are ready just to, uh, they, they see things and they're ready to jump in and they're ready to be creative and they see something and they're ready to run with it. So, so there's a full spectrum there. Things have really shifted this fall. And so thank you, Trevor, for what you put in the chat, because that, that affirms what I think we have been reading about the situation is that, that teachers just don't have anything left to give to professional learning that they're trying to survive. And yes, extracurricular activities restarting. We didn't have that in the spring. And so people did stay on um, after school and do learning with us. Thank you, Linda, I appreciate that. And, and maybe, what I'm, oh, oh, Raquel, did you wanna jump in? Sure, and, and maybe this is just a, a bit of an offshoot in there, in there to speak to this, but, and I'm, and I'm just gonna go back to the participants that I was speaking to in my research because these were specifically distance learning teachers, right? So this really creates a different context when you're talking to distance learning teachers versus when you're talking um, about face-to-face -face teachers who've had to transition um, into that particular piece. And I guess I would just say that those, um, and they were all from distance learning programs. And I'm just, I just wanna share the excitement um, that teachers had in terms of what can we create this to be? This is our opportunity to say, what do we want this to look like? And there was definitely for many of the teachers I spoke to who were, who were in there, this collaboration piece and going, what do we want this to look like moving forward? And there was a real excitement in there. And so, um, yes, the increased numbers was, was sending the, the overwhelm in there, um, for the teachers for sure, but there was also an excitement about being able to build something. And one of the things I guess that I would have a conversation about in terms of how this will affect education moving forward, just in the broader sense. And I would suggest in the, and maybe even just putting distance learning aside, because I think distance learning, not distance learning aside, but if we talk about distance learning and imagine what it can be now knowing we are, I, I think we are going to have the diverse needs of students taking distance learning. But my concern in this is with, is with teachers who were face-to-face -face, had to transition to um, supporting students online. And my concern is that they will now be doing double duty. That, that I guess that's my concern is that when we shift and go back to this, will there now be an expectation that you will have everything that you have online so that if a, a student is gone um, 
for two weeks because their parents are on vacation or that they're gone for, you know, that they're drastically gone, that, that this is going to be one more piece on the teacher's plate um, to address. Um, and and I, I would be concerned about that, but I really can see the two of these pieces merging well together if we can think of this in terms of a holistic education system, not a distance learning system, not a face-to-face -face system, but how can the two tangibly work together so that we're not asking our face-to-face -face teachers to do it all? Yeah, it can work, it can work. And I mean, I'm loving the comments, the catch and release piece. And, and I think, you know, I had one of my teachers explain something similar in terms of how one of my teachers, not one of my teachers, one of the, your colleagues in the province explained to me how, um, you know, she makes sure they get it, but they get the independence they need and they get the holding on um, piece that they, that they need. And so anyway, I guess I am concerned that face-to-face -face teachers are going to be asked to do it all. And rather you have these two pieces that can come together and work so well um, to uplift each other. Thank you, Raquel. I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you, Michael. I noticed you've just put, an, put um, a link within the chat, distinguishing between remote learning and online learning. And that's something that I'm sometimes guilty of not distinguishing between. And I apologize. I think I did that a bit with the last question, but. I do well, know we are running very short on time. Um, so what I would do is I would, and, and, and I'm not surprised, I knew this was going to be a great conversation. So what I might do is I might invite each of the panelists to take just 30 seconds or a minute and share any just, I know, any just final thoughts you have. And then um, perhaps if you're, you'll indulge me, I'd like to start. I, what I'm hearing is, is that as a profession, we have work to do, that we have had, frankly, all of us in one way or another, a traumatic experience the last 20 months, whether that be our, our distance learning classes exploding, whether that be, you know, I, I'll never forget March 18th, you know, you're going online, whether that's you were that role as a student, as a parent, or as a teacher. And well, there are opportunities to come from that. And I think I jumped there too soon in this conversation. I think probably what we need to do over the next little while as a profession is, is heal from that. Looking at the chat and hearing some of the comments from the panelists, there's, there's a great deal of, um, of fatigue right now. You know, Linda, you're seeing that, that professional learning is, has shifted in how teachers are, are able and willing to access it. And, and it's been a hard year and it's been a hard 20 months. So, so what I'm hoping though, what, what I'm, I guess I'm a bit of an eternal optimist. What I'm hoping though is, is as we start to move through this and as we return to whatever the new normal looks like, the lessons we've learned from this in terms of collaboration, in terms of student-led work in student-led pacing and all of those kinds of things, can, can be carried forward and, and become part of and, and central to the profession without burning out teachers. And I share some of your worries, Raquel. And I think I took a lot more than a minute. So I will be, we'll stop and turn it over to the talented people on the panel. If you want just a final last word before I, I just wrap up for the evening. Actually, I'll go next because I do want to show something and I'll drop the link for this in the chat. But as distance educators, and I know most of us in the room are, and I'll try drop a link to this. The best we can do is try to make sure that our students in our environment have success. And I, this is a wonderful article that was published by Jared Borup and a bunch of his colleagues that basically put forward this framework that in order for a student to have success, we need to engage them on three levels, cognitive, behavioral, and affective. And essentially, if you're looking at the chart there, the, the little black triangle in the middle is essentially what the student brings to the experience themselves. So their inherent abilities, if you will. What you see in the red on the outside is what they bring to it from their indirect experiences. So one of the folks asked about um, community members or parents, the role of parents in all of this, the other supports that are available in their local school. As distance educators, we're this orange part in the middle, this course community. That's what we can control, the types of supports that we put into our courses and that which our online programs provide. So that if you end up with a student that looks like this, 
where you know they have a, a, a great propensity for affective engagement, but not a lot for cognitive behavioral. And as you can see, their own personal community of support isn't that supportive. It means that as a online environment, we have to make sure that we have the ability to engage the student on all three of these planes in place of what we would hope their parents would do, or if you're in a supplemental environment, the normal school-based teachers would do. And I wanna leave you with this, because A, I think it's a wonderful framework, and, and B, it's something that usually goes under the radar, because teachers rarely read research. So it's always one that I try to put out there, and I'll drop the link in the chat now, and I will leave it at that. Thank you, Michael. Well, thanks. Thanks. I'm just going to, I'll make it even less than, than 30 seconds. I uh, just want to thank you for organizing um, this uh, event. It was great to be here. Great to have a conversation with everyone. And I learned a few things tonight, which is always awesome. And, uh, and Michael, you provided us lots of excellent resources. So thanks. And, and Raquel, you did a great job. And, uh, and I look forward to uh, publications from your research and impacts on the on the uh, entire world. Okay, great, thanks. And I just want to just express my gratitude to you, Raquel, because working with you over this last year has been a grand adventure and an incredible learning opportunity. And I think the greatest thing that I want to cite from your research is the excitement that it brings, the possibility and potential for distance learning because there, is, there are understandings out there that distance learning means has a certain look, has a certain feel. And, and I think what you do is you, your work has brought new life to it for me and what the possibilities there are that exist for distance learning. So prior to working with you this, in this last year and engaging with you in your research, the idea of social constructivism and asynchronous learning, like I have no concept of that. And you have opened that for me. And so I, I view distance learning now with great excitement and potential. And all I can think about is what are the possibilities and what might we do in this area in terms of professional learning for teachers? And for me, the biggest part of that is equity of access because in our province, we have teachers in all corners of the province who are um, remote. It's not just our Northern communities. And whether you're in a rural community in Southeastern Saskatchewan or Southwestern Saskatchewan and you're in a small rural school and you're the only person, what you have done is you have opened possibility for what we might dream for providing professional learning for teachers who are the lone person in their school who is interested in a certain area. So I thank you because you have, there's excitement and possibility in what you have brought. Yeah, everybody needs Linda on their team. I'm just saying everybody needs a Linda in their life. We just, we all need a Linda in, in our lives. Um, you know what, my final note, and I, of course, I, there's so many pieces here, but, but one of the things I guess I just wanted to, to bring back to this piece, one, thank you, um, I, the teachers in the province just so generous with sharing um, their experiences to help shape distance learning um, for, for, for everybody um, in a, the bigger picture, um, but I just want people to just not forget about why we need um, quality distance learning that connects students. There are students where distance learning is their safe place. It is their safe place to come and access their education and that they can get that quality um, community in there. And I just, um, beyond that this is for choice, beyond that this increases choice, that it's, it creates access and equity. And that is also true, but this is also so many students. And I, I just can't tell you the personal stories that teachers shared with their students who they come to this and it, it has part to do with anxiety, but that's not all of it. Some people, this is their safe place to come and learn in a community. And, and we owe it to all of our students 
to be able to do that. And we can do that. And that was really part of this research was we just need to be bringing distance learning to the forefront. We're not trying to take over face-to-face -face learning. We're not trying to be what, um, what, if other people's needs are met in other places, we're not trying to overtake that. We're trying to create quality experiences for all. And I really hope that that's what's coming through from this um, is what's possible. What can we do? And, and there's just, there is some great work being done. And um, if that could be shared and, and move forward, um, let's do it. Thank you, Raquel. So the mission of the McDowell Foundation is to fund teacher-led research in the province. And I rarely have a better example of why it is so important than what just happened here tonight. Having a teacher, a colleague, a friend, someone I've gotten to know pretty well over the last few years, be able to share her passion, her, her wisdom, her, her commitment to the profession in this type of environment is why I come to work in the morning. And it's why the McDowell Foundation exists. 30 years ago, when the McDowell Foundation was brought into being, I can't help but think this is the kind of professional learning and professional sharing that was being envisioned. So Raquel, thank you for sharing your, your work with us, your research with us, your knowledge with us. Um, I've so appreciated working with you over the years and I hope you your McDowell project coming to an end will not mean that that collaborative work comes to an end. To the panelists, I'm so grateful for all of you. I knew this was going to be an incredible night. Michael, it's it's American Thanksgiving and you're here anyway. And I do appreciate you indicated before that you were working today anyway, because we all know you're from Newfoundland. And, and, and I knew, you know what, when Raquel suggested I reach out to you, I thought, he's from Newfoundland. Of course he'll do this, even though I know he's never heard of the McDowell Foundation. So thank you for generously giving us your time tonight and your experience and the number of resources in that you put in the chat. I know that, that our teachers are going to go back and look at those. I know I'm going to go back and look at those, so thank you. Um, Dirk, I know Raquel has spoken of the support you've given her over the years. We at the foundation really appreciate those connections to the university and the willingness of faculty to come forward and offer us that support, that mentoring, that wisdom. And Linda, I don't even know what to say about Linda. It's so amazing that Linda, again, I mean, you notice she's in her office. She has not been home yet. I know she worked all day and then she more than willingly came and provided me a security blanket and provided the incredible professional learning and connection that she has with our teachers. And I'm so grateful to that. I, and I, I, I so appreciate every time I ask Linda something, she says yes. And well, I'm grateful for that. I also am very aware of her workload. So thank you, Linda. I know you're still in your office. I bet you haven't eaten. So please go eat. So I hope Raquel, you saw all of the comments in the chat. I mean, I hope that you saw all of this. I'm so grateful that all of you came in and participated in this tonight. It was a, it was an incredible evening. So, so. I encourage you to reach out and find out more about the McDowell Foundation if you're new here tonight. We do fund teacher-led research in the province. Our notice of intents are due in exactly five days. So if you're looking at the amazing work Raquel did and thinking, you know, maybe it's time to dip my toe in, give me an email tomorrow and I'm happy to support you in, in thinking about what you might want to look at as you move forward. What are your own passions that you might want to explore? So having said that, I did indicate that I would be respectful of time. I know there were a few questions that went unanswered. Michael has kindly put his email in the chat. So if there's something you can address, he can address, feel free to contact him. Also feel free to reach out to the foundation. I, I probably can find something that could, could meet your need if, you, if something you were curious about didn't get met. So, so thank you all so much. Have a wonderful evening. And um, I look forward to seeing where this conversation is going to go, because I get the feeling this is more of a beginning than an end. Thank you.